Good afternoon and welcome to At Yale Live. I'm Eric Gershon. In four days, the nation turns its eyes to Washington for the second inauguration of President Barack Obama. There will be song, prayer, speeches, poetry, all part of a pageant choreographed for inspiration and effect. To help us appreciate the art and stagecraft of this rare American spectacle, we're joined by a pair of guides well-versed in art and performance. Poet Elizabeth Alexander is chair of Yale's African American Studies Department and a professor of English. She wrote and delivered the inaugural poem for President Obama's first inauguration and is one of a tiny group of inaugural poets in the history of the United States. Joseph Roach, Sterling Professor of Theater at Yale, is an expert in stagecraft and performance and an astute analyst of theatrical display. Thanks to you both for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you. So, Elizabeth, let me start with you. What was foremost on your mind four years ago this week, in the days before you read your poem, Praise Song for the Day, at, at the President's first inauguration? Well, at that point, the poem was written. Uh, I finished it about two weeks before the inaugural, by the skin of my teeth, and so, that was the largest worry that I had going into the whole thing was, was the thing itself, the, th the thing that I had to produce. And mostly there was excitement and a whole lot of questions about the pageant, but more so excitement about the fact that we were actually about to inaugurate Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. I mean, if any uh, of us uh, takes ourselves back to going through that campaign, the election, and the aftermath, um, that's where I was, thinking that it was amazing that we were about to welcome this president and his family. And what about now, four years later? How, how is your, is it, is it again just excitement? There's presumably a little less pressure this time. Yes, and that's very nice. Um, it, it's lovely to be Madam Spectator. Um, it's wonderful that there is a, another poet uh, whose work I love, and I'm excited about what he's going to do. So. It, to be on the sidelines of that, um, but to also know that Obama has hopefully kept this tradition going that will continue after him of having a poet at the inaugural. Good, good. And I'm hoping to get some of your thoughts a little later in the program mm -hmm. about him. Um, and th this question is, is, is for both of you, really. Aside from its massive audience, which I assume to be a good thing, in what ways is the inaugural ceremony a desirable forum for art? Well, the occasion uh, is not only a massive audience, but it's a, a selected audience. It's citizens who want to participate by being there in person and the great space, the public space of the nation opens up and receives um, a multitude and then others join and see it in a mediated way. But they choose to be a part of it understanding that they'll be a part of history and they'll bring their children to enter into that space so that their children will remember having been a part of history and they'll bring their children to the to the screen to see it and classes will mm -hmm. uh, uh, stop their work in schools and the, the children will watch the inauguration to be a part of that history. We were reminiscing a moment ago about the Kennedy inaugural in uh, 1961, and there was a poet uh, at that inaugural as well, and uh, I remember it as a Robert seventh Frost. grader. That's right, yeah. Robert Frost. I remember it as a seventh grader. We stopped class uh, and we watched the inaugural, and it's a vivid memory. That piece of history is a part of the way I view myself as a citizen. And I, oh, sorry, oh, I just no, wanted no. To, to add to to those those beautiful comments that um, as far as art's place uh, in in that, um, you know, to say that art has a place in civic discourse, mm. to say that art in in different forms uh, has something to say to the citizenry about what it means to be American, because I mean, I think that you know, to take it a step further, that is also. Uh, the question that's called, what is this Americanness? What does it mean to be American together? Um, and I think there are some things that art can say and do that political language can't or won't. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, it's so wonderful to have it there. Are there, are, there, are there particular things that political discourse can't say or won't say that 
that you have in mind? Um, well, uh, you know, I think that there are ranges, mm. uh, right? That there are registers, that there are tones, that there are nuances that we are not uh, likely to hear in political speech. Um, so I it's just another mode of address. Mm. Um, but I think that if that means as uh, listeners, as spectators, we uh, can be worked on in various registers, mm. I think that that enhances the power of the feeling uh, and meaning of the day. Joe, if you were advising the inaugural committee on how to script the ceremony, what might you suggest? Are there important elements missing uh, or are there elements that you, you view as sort of overdone or underdone? Uh, we, we've just been talking about how it is a great form for art, but not all art forms are represented or can reasonably be presented in a single, in a single ceremony. Well, um, I wouldn't criticize, uh, but uh, I would have uh, all of the artists perform live as Elizabeth did so mm. memorably. Mm. Uh, because at that moment, and this is building on her comment, mm. but I want to say she set the bar high for all subsequent poets because the poet's task, I think, is to speak not only to the public, but for the mm. public, not just to America, but for America. And Elizabeth did, and I'm so proud of her for what she did that day for, uh, as a citizen and as an, as an artist for all of us. But uh, I would have it all live. I wouldn't have, for instance, uh, the greatest cellist of our time on a pre-recorded tape pretending to play mm. at the inaugural. I would have uh, Yo-Yo Ma play live in real time, even if he made a mistake, mm. because it's all right to make a mistake. Mm. Uh, Robert Frost had a very difficult time reading from his uh, text because the sunlight was so bright on that brilliant mm. uh, January morning and he couldn't read off from the glare so he struggled but um, it was still a great public poem by Robert Frost and uh, many of the words rang out nonetheless mm. and uh, his struggle was part of that performance so I'd have it be as real as uh, Robert Frost's uh, performance was as real as Elizabeth was in real time, speaking with transparency. And I must say, Elizabeth didn't make any mistakes. Uh, well, but <laughs> unless but, there was uh, a word that I missed, uh, uh, you, but, <laughs> that, you know, I, I didn't make any mistakes. But that's so interesting because I've always felt protective of the great Yo-Yo Ma, having heard the stories about, you know, instruments and cold and hands and cold and, you know, all of the mm. things that they can't do. And I sat next to Aretha Franklin uh, uh, mm -hmm. as she silently meditated, yeah. preparing to get up with her throat, thinking yeah. about what, mm. it was so cold. Yeah. And we were on the stage for a very long time, actually before the whole ceremony began at least an hour with no warmers of any kind. So, you know, those instruments, the musician's hands, the singer's voice, mm -hmm. the cold. But w when you say, let it be real, let there be room for error, um, uh, let it be the thing itself, I, I, I love that. Yes, well, good point uh, about uh, the physical mm -hmm. limitations on uh, that kind of authenticity. Uh, but still, I'd, uh, I'd take other measures, maybe throat warmers and hand warmers. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, even Yo-Yo Ma makes mistakes under ideal conditions in a concert hall. Mm. Well, that's right. Yeah. And he's still great. And he's still great. Yeah. So it's, still the, great. Is, is it, it's the spontaneity of live, truly live performance, right, that, that gives it an additional, an additional edge. And also, I, I guess that's a comment, but also a question. Um, uh, is it, is it the spontaneity, the, the possibility of a mistake that actually endows it with, uh, with a little more energy? Exactly. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. the, the essence of it. It's okay. the humanity of it. Mm -hmm. Just as in a democracy itself, you don't always get it right the first yes. time. <laughs> or right. sometimes the nth time. Mm -hmm. But yes, let it play out as it will. Another dimension to that, just uh, speaking uh, from a, a certain kind of aesthetic, I think for me in, in um, making a work, it's important to coordinate between the elements. And if one set of performers is in one plane and another set of performers is in another plane, 
one live, one pre-recorded. I think there's a kind of dissonance there mm. that we'd mm. be better without. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the president will be speaking uh, spontaneously, although I'm sure it will be carefully rehearsed, and I'm mm -hmm. sure he will have a, a prompter. But even so, he's making those words live in real time. Yeah. And I would have everyone on the stage with him in the same world. Mm -hmm. Um, Elizabeth, I have to ask, did you, did you, um, I couldn't tell whether you were, whether you had memorized the poem and were reciting it from memory or whether you were occasionally referring to a text. Uh, I, I memorized it, yeah. um, uh, it f in a number of ways. First of all, I lived with it so intimately mm -hmm. and so intensely that you memorize text that way. It just kind of comes into your body and you know it that way. But also, I memorized it and tested myself because <laughs> knowing the Robert Frost story, you know, I had, right. I had them, you know, tucked here. I had, I had extra copies. <laughs> I didn't, I wanted to be at the ready because, of course, who knows what they're going to do when they get up and look out at a million people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I thought that uh, I would account for that in, in advance. <laughs> so I was, I was referring to a text, but I had read the text. Now, having having grown up in you were memorized, excuse me. Uh, pardon. H having grown up in Washington, um, you've, you've been to the mall presumably thousands of times, and probably did some pretty extraordinary public events there. When you when you got up there, looking out at the sea of people before the mall, um, was that was that like a brand new experience? That is, or I should say, of course it was. But in what way was it a? Well, it was um, it was on a number of of wonderful um, kind of continuums for me. Um, the larger historical continuum I in which the moment was new mm -hmm. um, was, you know, I looked out and, and Walt Whitman's work had been so important to me preparing the poem and thinking about his idea of trying to kind of cast around the country and listen for Americanness. Mm. You know, how do you how do you sort of do that? How do you tune your ear to that? And so, you know, I pictured the hospitals of Civil War dead mm. on the on the mall and Walt Whitman tending those those people. I pictured all of the protests on the mall over the years. Mm. I pictured suffragists. I pictured the March on Washington, which I had gone to in the baby carriage with my parents. I, you know, I saw that great tradition of protest on the mall that is a part of what America is. I saw myself and the president and others on the stage standing on the steps of the Capitol mm. and thinking about the slave labor that built that mm -hmm. place where mm -hmm. we stood. So there was all of this remarkable history and yet a moment that was brilliantly new. Mm -hmm. um, and then, though in the moment I wasn't thinking about the personal, certainly in the time leading up, I mean, w I was six blocks from my childhood home. Wow. Um, I was somewhere, you, they, there didn't used to be all the security all over the, the, the mm -hmm. town. So, you know, when I was a teenager, that was where you'd go to smooch. That was where you'd go and walk around <laughs> whenever you wanted, mm. however you wanted. Um, we used to go and, and hear the naval band and, and see fireworks on the 4th of July, just stroll down and see that. Um, inaugurals for us growing up were a time where, especially if we didn't like the president, where we would uh, be annoyed at the influx mm. of tourists disturbing our neighborhood and uh, making everything closed down and complicated. So um, the intimacy of, I was in my neighborhood mm. and that was beautiful, although that was not on my mind when I was up on that stage. Then it was sort of the larger Focus, moment and, yeah. and even as a poet, I was not important. The poem, mm. poetry, was important. The word was important. The larger occasion was important. Well, speaking of uh, occasion, um, I want to ask about the, the kind of poem that you wrote and that you read. It's often referred to as, at least in, at least in the news media, as an occasional mm -hmm. poem. Um, and uh, if you would, just tell us a little bit about exactly what it is that defines an occasional poem and what, if anything, renders it in actual form, not just substance, is, is different from uh, a sonnet or any other kind of mm -hmm. poem people might be familiar with. Um, yes, and, and Joe will have something to say about this as well. Good. So an occasional poem is literally a poem written for an occasion. It could be a sonnet. Um, mm. It could be a haiku. It could be uh, in any form, but occasional marks the why of it, the how it, it, it comes to be born, and the expectation that it will in some way, whether directly or obliquely, 
address its occasion. Mm. Um, in some ways, I chose to be a little bit oblique with mm. the occasion. I wasn't going to say, hooray, Barack Obama. I wasn't going to say inaugural. There were some words that were not going to appear there. But it was occasioned by mm -hmm. uh, this moment, this shift, this incredible, uh, hopeful um, promontory uh, on which the country, I think, felt itself standing. Um, and I thought about, because um, I work with different forms, mm -hmm. sometimes making uh, changes in them, but, but starting with form, I thought about a praise song, which is actually a West African mm -hmm. uh, form, uh, and would also traditionally be an oral form, because what was unusual about this poem, uh, as opposed to any poem any poet ever writes, is that most people will never read it, mm -hmm. you see. Uh, and most people, you know, you write poems to be read, mm. but most most won't. So I thought it was kind of interesting to have something that, that came out of an oral tradition that was meant to be declaimed, that is to say, the praise mm -hmm. song, um, and not, again, to make it about the singular Barack Obama, but to make it about the country that had brought us to this point. So um, if, w if a person had never heard uh, Praise Song for the Day, your mm -hmm. poem, and had only encountered it in print, are there elements of it that mark it as, or they're recognizable to a person who's somewhat familiar with poetry as an occasional poem? Um, well, the, I in its official title, it's Praise Song for the Day, a poem uh, on the inauguration okay. of Barack Obama. Gotcha. And that's a, that's a part mm. of the title. Mm. That's always meant to be, it isn't always printed with right. it, but it's meant to be. Gotcha. But in its form, I mean, it has other f principles of formal organization. It's got a regular metric, mm -hmm. it's got a regular stanzaic uh, form and so forth. But none of that is in any way tied to what an occasional poem, mm -hmm. uh, because it c an occasional poem can take a lot of different mm. forms. Though it is tied to what an oral poem is, a poem meant to be spoken. Yes, yes, yes. Did you want to comment further on? Uh? Yeah, there are so many rich ideas here about uh, what it is to speak, what it is to speak poetry, um, and uh, the uh, process of making uh, a communication to a general uh, a public, but one that is yet, in a way, uh, intimate to the occasion because it's mm -hmm. so special. And one thing that uh, Elizabeth um, demonstrated um, in is what in my world we call the illusion of the first time. That is a speech that is carefully written, carefully rehearsed, polished, but then so well polished and rehearsed that it comes off as if it's being spoken now in real time, as if the words are forming for the first mm -hmm. time in the imagination, in the heart of the poet, and being spoken as we hear them. And that's a great gift and great political orators have it, and great poets who are poets of the spoken word, uh, who can read, and I put the word read here in quotation, yeah. because most poets who are great readers have their poems well to heart. Yeah, and they're, they're performed almost more than That's they're, right, yeah. uh, but of course, the magic of it is making people less conscious of the performance mm -hmm. than they are of the words. Mm. Um, I think many people think of poetry um, as a slow, deliberative, contemplative, spontaneous art form, uh, something that is born of, of, of a germ of a feeling, um, and not something like a newspaper story, which you know is almost uh, defined by the fact that it's going to be written on a deadline. And so the the concept of deadline poetry, as it were, almost seems a little bit like a contradiction to me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder uh, if you would tell us a little bit more about composing under those circumstances. Yes, because uh, I can assure you no one is ever waiting on the other side for <laughs> other poems. See, there's never any sense of time uh, unless you're writing for a, you know, a dear friend's wedding or something yeah. like mm -hmm. that. But, um, you know, we write as it comes, um, although also, you know, if you're serious about it, you stick to it so that you are present when it chooses to come. So mm -hmm. really, the discipline mm. and practice are much more important than the inspiration. It's about being where you're supposed to be uh, when uh, good words and ideas come. And for me, uh, and I think for many poets too, the germ is not so much in an idea, but it's a germ of language 
a sprout of language, mm. a word, a phrase, around which things are built, within which ideas are, are contained. Um, and so this was very different. There was a very, very short time period um, in which to write this thing and a kind of a, you know, drop dead deadline. I mean, you know, no wiggling, uh, 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 no nothing. Um, mm. And not to mention, I mean, you know, putting my whole family and everyone who loved me through, you know, we couldn't drag it out any longer than, uh, than, it, than it went. So it was an intense couple of weeks um, with many, 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 many drafts. Mm. How, how much advance notice did you get? December the 18th. Okay, so about a month. Well, roughly. but it was done. Bef- it had to be done before. Well, of course. Or yeah. I had to be done before. Yeah, right. I, I of course. You know, t- yeah. you know, I would be in a hospital. Can yeah. I ask Elizabeth <laughs> a question? About yeah, please go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering, and this is uh, in a way out of line because it's sort of like asking a tennis pro where she puts her thumb on the racket, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, m- I don't want to mess up your game, but. When you created it, I want to ask about performance too, but when you created mm-hmm. it, the, the imagery of those simple things, mm-hmm. the, 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 the celebration of those simple things that made the uh, elusive uh, language of the poem to the world, uh, at truths that the hand could touch, mm. at, at an arm's distance we could touch them, are those the things that came first? I'm trying to remember what came first. I knew that that was what I had to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that, for example, when I'm writing poems that don't have a, a place at the end of the day, um, there's a way in which, uh, you know, people ask, did I try to write a poem that was simple? And no. But on the other hand, did I avoid something so esoteric that it, it wouldn't have meaning to many, many people. I mean, you, you, you can't speak to everyone, but you know, you can imagine some exercises that simply wouldn't have been appropriate for yes. the occasion. Um, so in thinking about first images, um, yeah, it was, it was early on, it was fixing things. Fixing. <laughs> fixing things, yeah. mending the uniform, yeah. you know, the, darning the, the uniform, yes. mending the tire, yeah. fixing things. Um, also, the, the, teacher, the teacher says, pick up your pencils, begin, came early on, <laughs> uh, needless to say. <laughs> and, and my favorite story about that, you talk about all of um, the, the ways that, that, that we are citizens by watching collectively. <laughs> Someone wrote me a beautiful letter. She was a second grade teacher, <laughs> and she had it on in her classroom. And her students picked up their pencils and started writing oh my goodness. when they heard those lines in the poem. Mm. And many people said to me, um, you sounded like a teacher. And they meant it in a nice way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and my students, several of them said, you were you. You had teacher voice. That's right. <laughs> and I yeah. thought, well, that's a good thing. That's right. I think that's a good I thing. I think it is, too. And in, in my world, the, the language is that's transparency. Mm. meant in a slightly different way than it's said in political uh, contexts. Yes. Uh, meant uh, that you, you see the imaginative uh, being that's creating the work that mm-hmm. you're watching. You're mm-hmm. hearing those words that, that she is speaking. Yes. She, Elizabeth, is speaking. If I may, I'm going to uh, read a, a short excerpt from the poem, and I'd mm-hmm. love to hear, hear your thoughts on it afterward. We cross dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain that many have died for this day. Mm-hmm. Um, that just uh, sent shivers down my spine when I, when I first heard it and read it. Um, there's, it. It rings in a universal way. And to me, uh, it also suggests, explicitly references things that we think of as American, uh, work, opportunity, sacrifice. Um, And I'd just love to hear you talk a little bit about that particular part of the poem. Um, Well, thinking about it, it's so interesting to hear someone else read those lines. And it's also, I'm feeling that time has passed, Mm. you know. Um, um, But um, I'm thinking about the the turn in the poem, which is right at the last line that you read, Mm -hmm. say it plain, that many have died for this Mm -hmm. day. I mean, that's that's when you sort of know what you're in Mm. uh, and you know 
you know, kind of the deeper um, uh, portent of, of the moment. You know, let's just sort of put it out there. Um, and so can you uh, just ask again what you, what you wanted me to s well, say to those lines? I, I guess, you know, everybody responds to a poem and to art in general in a very subjective way. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, I picked those out because they stirred something especi especially in me. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but, you know, the creator may have intended something different or may have a different personal response to that part of the, of the poem. And I was just wanted to ask you if, uh, if, if there was something specific you were trying to suggest or um, well, with I think that part Yeah, of this is where I, I would get even a little artiste. You Please, know, go ahead. Well, because, and, and say, I'm so happy you saw that, and there you go. I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't, the process of writing a poem is um, so sub rosa. Mm. But yet in that strata is all of this structure and purpose. Mm. But the poet can't always articulate it mm. in the midst of, you know, it's mysterious. But it does have a shape and an order and a purpose. So um, I can sometimes step out of my work and, and just be a, a, a literary critic, mm. you know, or a teacher and say, okay, here we see this, this, and this. But my my response when you read that is to say, I'm glad you saw that. I'm glad it made you feel something. <laughs> um, and some part of me knew what I was doing, yeah. but it's not an articulate part of me. Um, I meant to ask earlier, did, did you get much in the way of instruction or guidelines? Were there any whatsoever? No, and that's what um, I, I think was kind of wonderfully um, first time about the whole thing. Mm. I mean, something else I remember about everything leading up to the inaugural is that it was kind of, you know, everyone was going by the, pulled by the scruff of their necks, like, oh my God, we, we actually won this election. It actually happened. Okay, well, we got to, we got to get the guy in. We got to get the guy up there. We got to have an inaugural. We've got to, we've got to do this. Um, so I think that probably things now are much more carefully managed or managed with the benefit of, of experience. Mm. Um, at the time, being left to my own devices, what was so powerful about that was, to me, it was the president and his administration saying, uh, if we picked you, we trust you to do what it is that you do. We trust artists to do what they do. Mm. So uh, I had to give the poem, uh, you know, 48 hours before for the sign language people. Mm. Um, but it was long done by then. Mm. Um, so. That seemed to me to be a wonderful faith in, uh, mm. in, in art. You know each other well. Um, did you uh, consult with Joe or any other uh, uh, theater folks before you went and actually performed the poem? Um, well, I didn't consult with Joe, but you don't know the story. Do you know the actress Tamara Tooney? Mm -hmm. um, she's a friend of mine, and she's a very um, fabulous diva. And uh, at some point I thought, oh, this is a performance. I should, I should consult. Um, and she's very grand. And she also is the person who said, oh, dear, you must go to an atelier and have a dress made. I'll arrange it. <laughs> and so, you know, there was all of this grandness, which, yeah. of course, I, I loved and loved. <laughs> but she said to me, you know, you might want to read this out loud with someone else in the room before you get up there and do it. <laughs> and right. I thought, you know, no, that'll scare me more. Yeah. You know, or or uh, no, you'll 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 make me actressy, but I'll be bad actressy. And I, you know, like no, I didn't. Uh, I, I need to be myself. I need. I know how to give poetry readings, and I just have to do it the way I know how to do it. But she said, "Darling, come over, and read it out." And I read it out, and in that way that when you read something, you feel and hear the words you've made, and I burst into extended sobs mm. and thought, good thing I got that out of the way. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I really thought, you know, yeah. it, w it, was, it was a catharsis, and also yeah. it was like when you listen to yourself for the first time, yes. and lis or, and li or listen to the thing outside right. of yourself. The poem that you read at inauguration was the occasional poem. That rehearsal with Sunni was your, your occasion. Yes, 
No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. You know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah. And then she, she said, I'm only going to tell you one thing. Um, because then I thought, what if that happens when I get up there? And she says, she told me two things. The first thing she says, if it happens, and this goes back to your point about realness, it will be apt and beautiful. Mm. So don't worry about that. And then she said, and the other thing is, she said, remember the people in the back of the hall. And so that was great because I don't know, you would have language for this at what distance a poet would sort of cast eyes and pitch, but she said, go back further. That's right. You know, go that's, all the way back. Uh, that's when it was to the horizon. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So that was, a, that was a wonderful thing. The conventional phrase is uh, the second balcony. The second balcony. Yeah, but okay. in your, the, in, on your occasion or the inaugural yeah. occasion, it was, it was the horizon. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, Elizabeth, I gather that you and Joe, for all I know you as well, have um, connections to uh, this year's inaugural poet, Richard Blanco. Um, and I wonder if you've, either of you have had a chance to speak with him or uh, what advice you have or might give him uh, as he prepares to. Yeah, do you, do you know this? him? I don't know him personally. That um, work. Um, yeah, he's, um, <laughs> I have known him a little bit for a while. Um, we, uh, his mentor, the poet Campbell McGrath, is one of my dearest friends, uh, uh, an oldest friends from high school, actually. Mm. Um, and so I've known his work and blurbed his work and so forth. He's a wonderful, wonderful poet. We've emailed back and forth, and uh, I've congratulated him and just told him that you know, I'm with him <laughs> um, because uh, I received a phone call from Maya Angelou, um, mm. uh, who I'd never met. Um, and of course, that was very different. She's an elder, she's, mm -hmm. you know, but she gave me a wonderful benediction. I, I wouldn't presume to do that in quite the same way mm -hmm. to Mr. Blanco, but um, it was powerful and beautiful to mm. be called into the history of the small community of, of people mm. who have done this thing. Um, any, th any thoughts based on your familiarity with, with his, his poetry and his, his mentor and what we might expect from him on Monday? Um, you know, I think uh, he's, he's a lovely lyric poet. Mm. Um, uh, his, he is very interested in Americanness mm. and in making ourselves as Americans. Um, and I think that that is an old and a new question. It's, it's one that, that we continue to grapple with, that, uh, that our great artists continue to grapple mm. with. Um, so I don't quite know what to expect, but uh, uh, that's, that's where the work is coming from. Mm. It, I, I suppose it's, it's really just trivia, but I was, I was very interested to read that he is, is trained as an engineer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, perhaps I'm just um, playing off stereotypes, but I don't think of, of poets as having, you know, this sort of rigorous uh, scientific training that, um, that that he obviously has. So it'd be interesting to see if that well, yeah, emerges you know, somehow. But but it's all you know. We all have our structures, our, yeah. our ways of, <laughs> of of finding structure. And so you know, yeah. Auden famously said that writing a poem is like solving for x. Mm. And uh, I can't do math, but I have solved for x, and it is like solving for yeah. x. You're 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 trying to make your way creatively to resolution. I think it was Maxim Gorky who said that poets are engineers of the soul. Mm. Ah, <laughs> even better. That's great. That's great. So the, the President of the United States obviously has many occasions uh, during uh, the term to address a mass audience um, and uh, global audiences. Uh, do you, either of you view the inauguration as a special opportunity for uh, the president, any president, uh, to communicate something in particular or in a way that the office doesn't, doesn't often lend itself to? Mm. What do you think? I would say that yes, and of course there are great precedents that uh, the president, President Obama, must feel now, such mm. as Lincoln's second inaugural, mm. the words of which are the kind of words that get carved in stone. Mm. Uh, but in this inauguration, even more than, than most, uh, the opportunity to speak to everyone as everyone's president seems to be a, 
a great challenge and an opportunity after a very divisive and bitterly fought uh, election mm -hmm. and with a, a political difficulties uh, in the offing, mm -hmm. it's an occasion to step back and to think of the larger project in which uh, everyone uh, who cares about the country is engaged. Mm. And, and I think also, you know, what are his modes of address? I mean, he has the State of the Union, which will be shortly after. He has press conferences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then he has, this president has had some extraordinary speeches made um, at occasions of collective mourning, you know, the words yes, he gave at, yeah. uh, in Newtown and mm -hmm. in Arizona Indeed. and so yeah. forth. And so I'm thinking about those different kinds of, of utterances and what is different from the inaugural. And um, I feel like, I could be wrong, that, that we don't expect inaugural speeches to be issuey. No. Like, you know, mm. I, I don't think we expect that he's going to say gun control. No. Even though that's very much something that he's dealing with right, right. now. Or he may, but it would be elusively evoked. Mm. Exactly. Because the inaugural occasion is as close to your art as it is to a political speech, such as the State of the Union or mm -hmm. the acceptance at uh, a nominating convention, the mm -hmm. other public occasions when there's a fairly well-worked-out tradition of how you address the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in a way, I, 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 when I think of this speech uh, and of the um, uh, demands on the, on the speaker uh, and the demands on this particular president, the moment that flashed into my mind when you asked the question uh, was the moment in which uh, the president addressed his campaign workers in Chicago after the yes. uh, election. An astonishing moment because mm -hmm. it was both, as is his want, under complete control. His affect was unchanging. The vocal quality only wavered once or twice, and yet he was crying tears uh, mm -hmm. that dropped from his chin during that speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not expecting him to weep at the inaugural, but there's something about that moment of reaching for the subjunctive, mm -hmm. the condition contrary to fact in which hope is expressed. Mm -hmm. Politicians often have to speak in the indicative and the interrogative. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a moment when he is authorized to speak in the subjunctive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish I were. I wish we were. Mm -hmm. Yes. Fill in the blanks. Yes. The, the President Obama is justly famous for his oratory, and so this would seem the ideal occasion to draw on all of those resources that he, that he has and that many don't. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's uh, move on briefly. Uh, what are your current projects? What are you guys working on now? Oh, Joe, what are you working Thank on? You're <laughs> 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 working on a lot of different things. <laughs> <laughs> there something you're We're really working on bail about. The, paying the bills for <laughs> our departments, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Elizabeth is chair and I'm DUS of <laughs> Theater Studies. So we administer We're advising all day these long. wonderful Yale students. And no, know. but uh, I'm, I'm working on a project that came out of uh, my research in uh, world performance where I had uh, companies visiting uh, the campus and my production team, uh, Emily Coates uh, and... Uh, and uh, Kate Creer and others uh, brought uh, artists from all over to, to the uh, campus and indeed uh, mobilized artists who were on campus, including Elizabeth, who launched us uh, by playing the um, Window of Opportunity Meister in Susan Laurie <laughs> Park's premiere of, uh, of, of her play cycle. It was great. Preparing me for the inaugural. That's right. We, uh, <laughs> we rehearsed it here first. She had, Elizabeth had wings, uh, wonderful uh, fairy wings uh, coming out the back for the window of opportunity, Meister. Nice. <laughs> that was so much it was, fun. It was a grand, grand sight. Um, I am working on um, a Library of America, big volume, complete history of African-American poetry, beginning to the present. So you're doing a lot of reading. So I'm doing a lot of reading. Yeah, yeah I'm doing a lot of of reading and a lot of archival work actually yeah. because um, there are um, some greatest hits that and some poets who you, mm. you just know you'll include yeah. but really to do it properly what you have to do is is first read again for the millionth time mm -hmm. sometimes and I set it chronologically everything by a poet and also to do some archival digging to find 
poems that appeared in in little magazines and so forth that might never have been mm. collected in 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 published books yeah. um, but that sometimes you find tremendous jewels there so uh, you probably have a number of difficult choices that you're going to have to make obviously I mean that that's kind of the hard work right of compiling an anthology I imagine is deciding what you have to leave out even though you'd love to include it yes and you know that's wh why for a while I thought I was going to try to avoid the contemporary because then it's your friends oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah. and uh, and that is not easy <laughs> yeah. but uh, you know to the true history you know we are faithful so whatever that may be that's what I've got to you know kind of listen for um, and it's it's very exciting it's exciting also to realize that this field, uh, these poems, these poets who I've been thinking about for such a long time that they can appear completely fresh mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you do a project in this particular way. Mm. Uh, are either of you attending the inauguration this year? Uh, you had a pretty good seat the last time. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'll be going with my, with my sons. Uh, we're heading down uh, tomorrow and we're all excited about it. Fabulous, fabulous. I'll be watching. Excellent, mm -hmm. um, as will I. Uh, well, I want to thank you both uh, very much for, for joining us today. This is a real special opportunity uh, to chat with you and hear your thoughts. Um, and I want to thank all of you for joining uh, us for At Yale Live and hope that you'll join us again next month. Thanks very much. Thank you.